All right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, so Jeff said that he was going to be very brief in his introductions of us. And uh, in my case, I thought he went a little bit too long at the beginning of this session because he said the economist, Dr. Ben Powell, if he had just shortened it to Dr. Ben Powell, given today's seminar topic, you all would have thought I'm the type of doctor who could help people. Instead, now, now the, the gig is up, you know I'm an economist, uh, which I'll tell you what I do in my day job then. I'm a professor at Texas Tech University where I run a group called the Free Market Institute where we train people uh, to become professors and talk about ideas about free markets and Austrian economics and such. And I'll tell you just briefly where I come from on this. Uh, because it's relevant with our host today. Uh, when I, I grew up around here, I did my undergraduate at UMass Lowell, and I didn't have any a single free market professor there, as you might imagine. Uh, but I stumbled across, across the writings of Ludwig von Mises, Mario Rothbard, Frederick Hayek while I was there, became interested in these ideas, and learned that there was something called Mises University down in Auburn. And when I, this is late 90s when I was an undergraduate, I was starting to think maybe I'd like to become a professor one day. And I went down there and spent a week with them studying Austrian economics, seeing the passion of the professors that they had. And I left that week knowing exactly what I wanted to do the rest of my life. So I'm always appreciative of the Mises Institute and, and happy to be able to speak for them. Uh, <clears throat> Now, particularly happy to be able to speak for them here in, in New Hampshire, because I can flip back into my native Merrimack Valley cadence of speech, and you all don't need seatbelts to keep up with me, uh, versus when I go down and visit Auburn, where some people are online, and slow it down for all of them all. Uh, so <laughs> it'll feel more comfortable today. Uh, so my topic's a little bit different than other people here. I'm going to be talking about the pandemic and how it relates to economic science and the rationale for regulation. So people told us this last year, follow the science. And when they did, they always seemed to mean listen to epidemiologists or medical doctors, but that's not the relevant science. That's just measuring one type of outcome that has to be weighed against other ones. I know a science that deals with uh, weight, uh, weighting values against each other when we have scarce resources. It's called economics. It's the economic science people need to listen to to figure out if there is a rationale for a type of government regulation during this pandemic, and if so, what that looks like. And I'll tell you what it does not look like is lockdowns or any of the policies that we got over this past year. So to start with, knowing... <laughs> <laughs> you guys are nice, but you're going to slow me down. Uh, so if there's going to be a case for regulation during this, it doesn't come because the disease is deadly or any other physical characteristics. There's lots of things in the world that can be deadly or bad for us, uh, but that doesn't mean that human interaction needs to be regulated by a government or anybody else. If there's going to be a case from it, that case has to come from the science of human interaction or economics. So if I was going to try to make a case for it based on economic science, the case has to come from something we talk about as externalities or spillovers, where one individual's decision making, where they weigh costs and benefits to themselves, results in spilling over some of those costs to other people. Because if it's all internal to yourself and there's a dangerous disease out there, make your own choices. If you get it, you get it, it's a bad outcome, but you rationally weighed the costs and benefits. What mattered was not your life expectancy, but the subjective value in your mind of doing the activities. That's why simply the deadliness of something does not matter. Where the case for the regulation would come from is that my putting myself at risk spills over risks onto other people that they then have to account for when making their decisions about what risks to take on. Incidentally, note, the other thing people have got sidetracked on this. Economists are known for measuring this, economists are really popular, measure, measuring the statistical value of life and putting a dollar figure on people's lives. And then some people have been trying to weigh the costs and benefits of dollar value of lives saved. For, nope, that's the wrong calculation too. Not even in mainstream economics do you get that answer. The externality is the extra cost people take on themselves because of the increased cost to them of risks other people are taking. That number is a whole lot smaller than the statistical value of lost life to start with. So if we're going to be thinking about this then, we have to be thinking about how would regulations regulate us spilling over some of these risks onto others and make us account for them more so that we, when we make our own calculations, engage in the kind of optimal amount of risk taking uh, when we account for not just our own but everybody else's. So 
First off, we have to realize these things are partially internalized anyway. First, actually, something that's not even on the slide, to the extent that the news scaremongers everything and people overestimate their own risk, I've seen no shortage of young people who way overestimate their own risk, to the extent that they're doing that, their internal cost-benefit calculations for themselves probably brings them closer into line to what they should be doing to caring about other people who are more at risk. Uh, <clears throat> Second, to the extent that it makes you care about grandma or somebody else who might be at more risk, when I think we probably all know people who contracted, at, contracted their risk-taking activity at particular points over the past year when they were, knew they were going to uh, interact with somebody that's of higher risk. That's taking account of other people. You don't need regulation there. Just social norms do that part of it. Finally, in interacting, and this is what this is about, in places of business, a lot of this is all internalized to our behavior already, not because we intrinsically care about the other people in the business, but because the owners of the business have to care about the people in their business caring about other people spilling risk over on them. So this is the exact same, well, at step one, it's the exact same as smoking regulations. There is no, people talk about, oh, well, smoking is like air pollution that spills over and other people don't like it, so you're not taking account of them. Well, not if it's in a restaurant or bar. The restaurant or bar owner has to weigh the benefits smokers get from being able to smoke with the, uh, the cost of other people not liking that smoke, and then has to set policy accordingly. In a world where owners are free to choose, in the years past, this looked like smoking and non-smoking sections. Some restaurants that were smoke-free, most bars that had smoking. Now, over time, those were changing because market forces dictate that the owners respond to it. I live in a city that still has smoking freedom, believe it or not. Uh, Lubbock, Texas allows bar owners to decide for themselves. And, uh, there was a case a couple years ago where people were trying to get an ordinance that would make the whole city non-smoking there. And uh, they said, well, look, it's all going that way anyway. And I'm like, well, the point is you don't need the regulation then, because as norms have changed over the last 20 years and more people don't like smoke and fewer people smoke, more and more bars went non-smoking. This is market regulation. Don't snuff it out at the few places left for the rest of us. Uh, so this is an internalizing of the externality because the business cares about the profits, and those profits have to care about the preferences of both the smokers and the non-smokers. Ditto during COVID. For people who want to be in a social environment, some place more of a value than others on being spaced out, on having masks, on having plexiglass, whatever the various mitigations are. And each business owner has to decide for himself what his optimal policy is. How much extra safety should we be doing based on the wishes of my customers, both who want to interact and who want more distance? So the spread within a bar or a restaurant is not a spillover. It's not an externality. Now, it might happen. But just because it happens doesn't mean it's not an externality. It doesn't mean, excuse me, that it is an externality. It's something that's a bad outcome of something that was rationally chosen, not an externality. So what remains? So it's not completely like the smoking story because the smoke from one bar doesn't spread into the smoke from to the next bar. Imagine you're sitting on Bourbon Street and who goes to Bourbon Street and goes into one bar? Not me. Uh, maybe some of you do. You go from one to the other to the other, right? But that means anything that you catch in one, you then bring into the next that you go into, into the next that you go into, et cetera. So that means one bar's optimal risk mitigation is contingent upon what the risk mitigation is going on in the other bar. And similarly from there to your supermarkets, to your other, all the other places that you interact. So that's the remaining externality. So it's partially internalized. So a big part of the rationale for regulation has been taken away. But there is a piece of this that remains. And for our finer points, for I know there's fans of Mises Institute who come to lots of Austrian things here, externality within Austrian economics, you can't really value it. It's not traded on the market, so we don't have a demonstrated price for it. The concept is still there. Uh, Mario Rothbard talked about it in Law, Property Rights and Air Pollution in the early 80s article that he had did. But just because you can't derive it from that doesn't mean that the concept's not there. It just means we're not going to be real precise with trying to, to measure this thing. But we can kind of get a scope on, uh, a hand on what the scope of, of this is as we think through this. So next step then. Okay, so some externality remains. That means there's going to be some inefficiently too much amount of spread. And by the way, I'm taking, for the purposes of this talk at least, taking as given that the spread of it is a negative externality, there is a positive aspect to it, right? If young people transmit it among themselves who aren't at greater risk, it helps build you closer to herd immunity. That's a positive externality, just like people getting a vaccine is a positive externality. So to some extent, that's mitigating it against that negative aspect as well. Uh, I'm just gonna take as given that if it remains that there is a net negative of the transmission. So if there is, 
We know with COVID, and we knew really early on, that it varies significantly by age and health status. As an oversimplification, the old and infirm have very high risk from it. The young and healthy don't have very much risk from it. So the spread, the value of that externality between young health people, it's really small. Probably not worth doing anything about. The concern has to be more about does their activity then spread it to people who are at a much higher mortality from it. So what would a regulation like that look like? Well, we also know that externalities are not unidirectional. So if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, did it make any sound? Well, if there's no old and infirm people to spread COVID to, there is no externality from the young people towards them, which means the existence of old and infirm people is itself an externality on the younger people if you can track their activity. This is both directions. If we don't have people at risk from it, then the people who aren't at risk don't bear, have to bear a cost. But that means if we impose, so we have to decide then how are we gonna allocate these rights? Do we allocate the rights to the young and healthy or do we allocate rights based on the preferences and characteristics of older and infirm? Well, I've got a picture of Ronald Coase up there, which means if Walter Blockworth was here today, he'd bounce it in his seat saying, Coase is a commie. Uh, but, it, uh, but with this, I differ. I, I like Coase, and I, there's aspects of my life, and it's a very relevant insight that he has here, both on the reciprocal nature of a, an externality, a spillover, and then if you care about overall efficiency, how to assign the rights. And what you say is you assign the rights thus that the least cost avoider is the one who bears the consequences least cost avoider bears the consequences. Well, young and healthy people are trying to get their education, work, and provide a livelihood for their families. Older and infirm are disproportionately retired and not doing as valuable activities. This means step one would be allow the young people to interact and say, older people, you're gonna to have to severely contract your activities if you're worried about the risk in order to mitigate it. You try to put the mitigation effort on the person who does it more cheaply. It seems, in this case, lockdowns get it ass backwards. They lock everybody down, contract very valuable activity, while doing that to slightly lessen the risk for an older group that otherwise could be a, a lower cost avoider. So governments, just following, by the way, not unique Austrian points on here, just straight up normal economic price theory, got it ass backwards. Now, that doesn't mean a normal mainstream economist will then take from that and say, next up, okay, so we should do nothing. What they say is lockdowns get it backwards, so how should we regulate? So they'd say, well, we should do something to make them contract activity on the margin that will reduce some of this spread. Now, what did we actually get? Once lockdowns and stay at home were done, we got command and control. Uh, so here's one example of it, Como's unnecessary obligated menu options with your freedom fry or Como fries for $1. This is where in order to order a beer, you also had to order a meal. So if the bars were serving $1 meal, uh, meals. My personal favorite in my town of Lubbock, uh, a bar or brewery to remain nameless, uh, <clears throat> started to impose it because they had to have 51% of their revenue come from non-alcohol in order to qualify as a restaurant and be open. So all of a sudden, each beer was half price, but each beer came with a tasting fee equal to the price of the beer. And the tasting <laughs> fee was a non-alcohol revenue. <laughs> Uh, which I thought was fantastic. So when you're doing command and control regulation like this, your regulators would actually have to know the subjective valuations of the mitigation costs that they're imposing. The subjective valuations of the cost to the businesses doing them and to the people who are jumping through the hoops and doing the song and dance to comply with their command and control regulations. Something as simple as wearing a face mask. What is the cost of wearing a face mask? It's not just a monetary cost. Uh, it was in Joe's remarks at the beginning of today, he said how great it is to see everybody's face. It's the loss in value people have to not seeing each other's face when they interact and wanting. There's no way some regulator knows the cost of that for every different people, person and can calculate the optimal amount of that. That's simply not there. Or the optimal amount of spacing in the restaurant or anything. Epidemiologists don't know the subjective trade-offs or the subjective costs of all of the mitigation, which is what it would be necessary to know if their damn rules were actually the optimal ones for regulating this. Now, this isn't rocket science to economists or even normal mainstream economists either. We've known about this pollution, for instance, for a long time. If there's a, a carbon pollution that goes into the air and you wanna make factories account for that, we could do command and control and tell each factory exactly what production process you used to use, which scrubbers to install to decrease their pollution, or they can set a tax equal to the value of the externality and let each firm figure out for itself 
how to mitigate that in order to lower their tax rate or to keep polluting and pay the tax. Or for some firms who might get rid of it altogether and other firms don't no mitigation at all and pay it. That's if you could set the tax equal to what the value of the externality is, which as I've already said, we don't actually have a precise number on it because it doesn't fall out of market-based choices for the central planners, but at least that's how you'd start approaching it, not lockdown, not lockdown light of command and control, but something that gives a price for people to internalize. So concerts still can happen, but there's an extra tax on your tickets depending how many you sell. Some people who live their lives going to bars, I mean, I don't know any, uh, who really value that, maybe that's a really high value activity even if there's lots of transmission, and they should just pay a penalty to account for them spilling it over to other places but still be able to do it because they get so much value. You gotta leave people more freedom to choose if you're gonna find the lower cost ways to mitigate this while leaving the more valuable activities still happening because no planner knows what those actually are. So. That's what an economy, a mainstream economist would say about kind of getting to optimal regulation. But as a guy who does comparative analysis, I look and say, if you give the power to the government to do this, what are they actually gonna do? They're not gonna follow the advice of some economist in a lab coat. What they're gonna do is they're gonna base their policies on politics, just like we've seen over the last year. And this means that policy is gonna be driven by fear and news media and uh, uh, hyped fear in a population interest groups that wanna get revenue from themselves or shut down other businesses, where mom and pop stores have to close but big box retailers can stay open. You're going to get policies that the demagogues use to keep themselves in power and get more power for themselves going forward. And of course, this is exactly what we've gotten. Uh, but I have been embarrassed that my fellow economist of my profession has been so quiet about this. Numerous people have talked about the unemployment effects and other things, but not about just the logic of there is no logic for this regulation. Instead, I've seen lots of economists debating the epidemiologist statistics and other things, and I'm like, you guys are missing the boat. It's your bread and butter where you need to be talking, even to get the conversation to where I just got it, never mind to get it to this next part about what's political economy gonna give us. Uh, so instead, I mean, if they ever did get to that point, just like what we've seen in the stimulus bills and what spending goes to, the taxes would be uh, uh, set not based on externalities, but based on what businesses they wanted to contract first, which ones they wanted to favor more. Uh, and then the revenue allocated from it would also go to the favored interest group so that you pay off teachers unions who haven't worked in a year, uh, who don't wanna go back to work because that's the one that Biden wanted to support in that instance. And if it was the Republicans, it would just be somebody else who was getting the payoff. This isn't a, a R or D type thing. <sighs> so, what I'd say then is, in light of what political economy we get you, even if there's some spillover that remains, what's a better day, way to deal with it? Say first, look, and this fits more with the theme of a lot of what the other speakers have to say in this conference. First, look at things that would lower the value of this externality, meaning making this less deadly and more manageable, which means freeing up existing regulation in healthcare that made healthcare not as good at dealing with this as it otherwise could. So deregulate to remove barriers to medical competition and innovation. So doctor and physician licensing, the state-based nature of this, the telemedicine, things that we've seen, temporary rollbacks from various states during the pandemic, more of this widespread all around so that the market becomes more flexible and can deal with places where there's a surge and where there's not a surge by actually reallocating medical supply across lines that politicians draw on Apps for no good reason. Uh, then things like we saw warp speed and people talked about what a great development this was. Warp speed, they developed the first vaccine almost as soon as they had sequenced the virus. Then we waited nine, 10 months for the FDA to get around to approve it. That's warp speed at government speed. How about the first time the scientists figure that out, you get the right to try. Anybody who wants to use it, go ahead and use it. If it doesn't work out well for you, you had the costs and benefits, it was your risk, you took it. But guess what? You'd provide actually a positive spillover because we'd all learn from you and that would help us better understand it going forward of which ones work and which ones don't. That would be warp speed is just freeing innovators to offer their products to consumers who are free to try. Uh, ditto, we saw it of course with the government's botched testing. Um, and for that matter, thinking about the, uh, once vaccines did become available, the government being a monopoly purchaser of it and then having command and control regulation of who's going to be able to get it and where it's going to be distributed to. And by the way, when they say it's obvious, just older people first, it's not obvious to me. Yes, mortality is higher in them, but if we're talking about people undertaking mitigation to reduce risk to others, there's one strategy for reducing risk to others, contract activity. 
there's another, get the virus, uh, excuse me, get the vaccine, well, I guess that's what it actually is one way, but I meant get the vaccine and then go out. Who's the lower cost mitigator? The government central planners don't have, or who's the lower cost one who should be getting? Government central planners have no knowledge of who that should be. Instead, you needed a market for it, sell the damn things. Let market prices dictate where early doses should go. Heck, if you wanted to then, take the revenue you got from that and then pay people to get the vaccine who don't want to get it later. Uh, if you're really concerned with spillovers. Instead, we had the botched command and control version of this. Now, I think the good news is this is, over time, the value of the externality gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and the optimal strategy, even in an unconstrained political economy world, gets closer and closer to nothing, uh, because as more people have vaccines or natural immunity via infection, transmission goes down, and it becomes uh, more like a, a normal disease spread rather than what we had seen at times during, during this past year. Uh, so even in a market where you did not do any regulation and you just let it play out its course, my main point is business mitigation and civil society take care of a good chunk of this. And then the longer it goes, the closer we get to actually the, that being the optimal policy anyway. Uh, instead, of course, what we got was hygiene socialism uh, or fascism, if you want to make it sound like fascism. <laughs> so... That's our lockdown, that's our command and control, that's our, our government speed of warp speed. Uh, and what I'll say is what worries me the most is the dangerous Higgsian racket. So ratchet. So Bob Higgs, who's done so much great work and spoke many times at the Mises Institute, talks about the ratchet effect and the growth of government and government scope, scale, power. And you have a crisis, it takes on extra powers. When the crisis is over, it lightens up a little bit, but not back to where it was before. And this has certainly in my lifetime, probably in all of our lifetimes, been the greatest encroachment on our liberties domestically here in the United States that the US government has done, I believe. 9-11 uh, was a big deal, but a lot of that intervention went abroad. As, as a proportion of it, it was much smaller of what we lost at home. This has been entirely here, and America's liked it. They're not gonna give those powers back easily. Um, so I am, uh, worried that our fellow Americans are afraid to be free and that there's government bureaucrats who are all too happy to oblige them in that and keep these powers and try to regulate us going forward for much less serious things. So I'm going to wrap up there, but with the, for those of you that are Mises Institute veterans and have been to a number of talks, uh, you will have noticed without Tom Woods here, there is considerably less same, shameless self-promotion of selling books. So I, I promised Jeff that I would uh, pick up the slack for him a little bit. So I did bring about a dozen copies of my latest, or one of my recent books called Socialism Sucks, Two Economists Drink Their Way Through the Unfree World which is, uh, it's kind of an Anthony Bourdain style first-hand travel account as my co-author and I, Bob Lawson, went around the world drinking in these countries that mixes instead of you know, Anthony Bourdain and food, it's uh, uh, economics and history uh, being explained in between beers. So we go from uh, beer drinking to block quotes of Ludwig von Mises as seamlessly as possible. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'd be happy to, uh, uh, sell anybody a copy for 20 bucks who wants one and then instantly devalue it with my signature so that you can't resell it. Um, I, I'll say one last thing on the, the book did very well. It made it all the way up to number five on Amazon overall bestsellers. But I was more pleased, and this is the part you'll like, that for like, over a month, it was the number one bestseller in the category of communism and socialism because <laughs> some, books, some books are more, more equal than others. And also simultaneously, the number one book in the category of beer. Uh, so very pleased with that. Thank you all for your time today. <laughs>